another storm to come in. So I got here last night a little after midnight. So, but it, it's a pleasure. And if I'm correct, this is the highest point in Dallas County. Yes. yes. And it's your property. It's God's property. And I want you to understand something. When you talk to those of us that have served in the military, especially my infantry brother here, we have a saying. Always take the high ground. All right. We have a saying, we'll see you on the high ground. And I think that's one of the things that we have to do as the body of Christ. And especially men in the body of Christ. We have to seize the high ground. So I thought about what could I do to start off with you all today. And uh, this is my everyday daily devotional. And, and I get one at the beginning of every year. And this is a strength for today for men. Because I think it's so important that men start to go into God's word and find those scriptures and find a message that is to us. Because when you talk about being on the high ground, when you talk about the shining city that sits upon you, when you talk about being the salt, a lot of people don't understand why did they talk about being the salt. Because back in ancient days, and I'm sure Pastor Robert talked about this, back in the ancient days, salt was more important than any other commodity out there. Yeah. Because salt preserved the meat. Meat was spoiled in no time flat. And so when you're talking about being the salt of the earth, the salt here in this country, that means you're here to preserve. Preserve what? The very basic foundations of who we are. Yeah, yeah. And if anyone wants to try to tell you that this is not a Judeo-Christian faith heritage nation, they don't understand the basis upon which this nation was founded. That's right. You know, some of us have been in many different countries. I've been in 13 different countries in three different combat zones. There is no other country in the world that was founded on the premise that America was founded upon in the Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. They said that your inalienable rights, your life, your liberty, your property. If you go back, you have to study a guy by the name of John Locke. But your life, your liberty, your property, Thomas Jefferson called it pursuit of happiness, is not given to you by man. Right. It's endowed to you by the creator of God. Amen. Amen. But if we as men if we as Christian men don't study and understand that, if we don't study and understand as God told Joshua in chapter 1, verses 5 through 9, and I think Joshua's a paratrooper like me. Paratrooper's real hard-headed. You got to tell us stuff like one time, two times, three times, a lot of times. But God told Joshua three times in 5 through 9, be strong and good courage. Yeah, that's what he told him. Amen. Three times. But you know what he also told him? He said, this book of the law, yeah. you shall meditate upon it day and night. You shall not turn from it from the right or to the left. Mm -hmm. And as long as you do that, you will have success and prosperity wherever you go. Mm -hmm. See, the problem is that we're not going out. We're not sharing the book of the law, mm -hmm. which is here, mm -hmm. the word of God. But also, we're not sharing another book that was divinely inspired that I never leave home without. Mm -hmm. The Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And why is it so important to study this and then to study that? Mm -hmm. The very first liberty that you have in the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights, what is it? Freedom of speech. It's not freedom of speech. Oh. And as a matter of fact, yeah. that was Life. something that even if it is in a Constitution class, there you go. the university said freedom of speech. <laughs> Yeah. Way wrong answer. It's not life. The very first liberty you have, freedom of religion and the free exercise thereof. Wow. That's your very first liberty in the rule of law, the book of law of the United States of America. And why is that the very first liberty that you have in the United States of America? Because you go back to a guy by the name of King Henry. And when King Henry wanted to have a divorce from his wife, remember? <laughs> he said, you know, hey, Pope, we want to have a divorce from my wife. <laughs> and the Pope said, no. And he said, okay, booger you, mate. Me going to start my own church. Yep. Me going to start the Church of England. And I'm going to make me the head of the church. <laughs> and that is what happened. 
That's the lesson that I found and said, because all of a sudden, King Henry made himself the head of state, but also the head of church. And therefore, he prescribed what the religion would be, yeah. what was acceptable. Not what the word of God said, it was what he said. Mm -hmm. And so there was his most favorite advisor, a man by the name of Thomas Moore. Oh. If you've never seen that movie, read the story, you should do so. Yes. Thomas Moore said, I will bow down to you as my king here of England, but I will not bow down to you as my king because I only have one king. Mm -hmm. His most trusted advisor, his right-hand man to King Henry, yes. was beheaded. Yes. And so Thomas Jefferson, came up with this thing called separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny because when you talk to even kids at Liberty University, they think it's in the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> they think it's in the Constitution of the United States of America. It's nowhere to be found except a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptist Convention of Danbury, Connecticut, that said here in the United States of America, we will not have a head of state that is also a head of church, and we will not have a state-sponsored religion. Yeah. And why did he write that to the Baptist Convention in Danbury, Connecticut? Because the Baptists in Danbury, Connecticut were worried that the Presbyterians were going to be in control of the government. <laughs> now, I want you to take that concept and understand where we are today. Because everyone is telling Christians, you can't get involved in the government. You can't get involved in politics. You hear it all the time. And they always quote separation of church and state. But then when you ask them, they can't tell you where it is. But that's so important, men of God, that you understand these precepts, that you understand this book of the law, which is God's word, and also you understand this book of the law, which is your constitution, your rule of law, because one gave you the other. But see, today what is happening is that there are certain people with their ideology that are saying that, much the same as King Henry, this is the new religion. Mm -hmm. yeah. The new religion is same-sex marriage. So true. The new religion is gender dysphoria, transgenderism. Mm -hmm. You know, God couldn't get Adam and Eve right. God couldn't get man and woman right. You could be whatever you want to be, mm -hmm. okay? That whole image of God thing, forget about it. Make yourself in whatever image you want. That's the basis of secular humanism. That's really the basis of what happened at the Tower of Babel, where people thought that we could come together, we could build a tower, we could touch God, because we could be equal to God. This whole thing about murdering babies in the womb. Deuteronomy 30 and 19, what does it say? It says that I set before you today these two choices, life and death. Choose life, life so that you and your descendants shall live. Psalm 127, 3 through 5 says, Blessed are children, they're a gift from the God. Blessed is the man who has children, for there are like arrows in his quiver. Mm -hmm. Didn't tell you to go out and break the arrows. Talked about how you're respected for the children that you have. Jeremiah 1 and 5. I knew you before you were formed in the womb. Mm -hmm. But yet today, we're being told that people have a right to take that gift that God has given, the safest place for a child, and dismember it piece by piece by piece. Mm -hmm. To the point where in some states, it can be done all the way up to the time of birth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or in some states, like California, even after a baby is born, mm -hmm. it can be killed, mm -hmm. which is infanticide. Mm. And oh, by the way, if you think that that's something new, remember Solomon always said there was nothing new under the sun. Mm -hmm. Well, just think about how when Joshua, you know, who was told to be strong and of good courage for the Lord thy God shall never leave you nor forsake you, go and read Joshua's farewell address in chapter 24. Everyone talks about George Washington's farewell address or... Uh, you know, Ronald Reagan's farewell address. But jo Joshua's farewell address in chapter 24 has a very important verse. What was his parting words to the children of Israel? Choose, you this Choose for yourselves today whom ye shall serve. Mm -hmm. Being that the gods of the Amorites are the gods from across the river, but as for me and my house, my house, men, me we. and my house. Yep. We will 
serve the Lord. Yes. See, too many men, Christian men, have abdicated their God-given duty and responsibility That's right. here on earth and in their homes. And all of this evil that is creeping into our homes, creeping into our communities, we got to make a stand. Right. And see, it's incredible that, you know, Joshua says that in, in verse 15. And he challenges the, people, the children of Israel. They say, yes, Joshua, we will continue to serve the Lord. We will never forget what the Lord God has done for us, bringing us into the promised land, bringing all these enemies down before us. He said, all right, now, you know the Lord, he can be a vengeful God. Yet, yes, we give our witness. But then, Pastor, when you flip over to the next book after Joshua in the book of Judges, you start in chapter 2, verse 10. Joshua and the generations passed on, and the children of Israel did what was wicked in the sight of the Lord, fell down and worshipped the Baals. And who was one of the gods of the Baals? Moloch, the god of child sacrifice. So all of a sudden, yes, Joshua, we will never forget. And then generations later, they're offering up their own children. The sacrifice. And the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. And they were given over to plunder and to plunderers. I think y'all see where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, it doesn't matter how you fix your economy. You know, I mean, I can sit down and I can have all kind of economic policy discussions with you, tax policy discussions with you, fiscal policy discussions with you, fix it in no time. Energy policy, we can fix it. National security policy, foreign policy, domestic security policy, you know, reestablishing law and order. But if we are not a virtuous nation, if we are not a nation that understands our fundamental principles and values and our foundations, we will continue to be given over to plunder and to plunderers. Eight to nine to ten to eleven million people illegally in the United States of America. Mm. Terrorists in the United States of America. Criminals coming across in the United States of America. Criminals being released from prisons back out onto the streets. A young woman at the University of Georgia, nursing student, minding her own business, out going for a run, and someone that illegally came into this country through Texas somehow got to New York, ends up killing her. Psalms 11 and 3 says this. When the foundations are being destroyed, what shall the righteous do? And that's what I'm asking. You can't be passive. You got to be active. You can't be afraid because our God already said, be strong and of good courage for the Lord thy God shall never leave you nor forsake you. Isaiah 54, 17 says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every time which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. But that's the heritage of those who love the Lord. John 16 and 33 says, there will be trials and tribulations, but be of good cheer and encouragement because I have already overcome the world. In Romans 5, 3 through 5, it says, there will be trial and tribulation. And it tells us that we should look for it. Why? Because trials and tribulations produces perseverance. Mm -mm. Perseverance produces proven character. Yes. And proven character produces hope, not hope in man. Mm. Okay? Not hope that man is going to grant you your rights because man will take them away, but hope in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Philippians 4 and 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So why is it? That the body of Christ, and I want you to listen to this note, on average in a presidential election cycle, and you can check my numbers, you can go to a website called My Faith Votes, but on average in a presidential election cycle, 25 million Christians don't vote. On average in a presidential election cycle, now a presidential election cycle, think about the others, if on average in a presidential cycle, 25 million Christians don't vote. So how many Christians do you think come out and vote during a city council election? School board election? County commission election? Sheriff's election? 
Because all of a sudden we have bought to this line that says that you're not supposed to be involved in this. You, you, you're just supposed to do whatever the government says. The devil knows scripture too, y'all. And those people out to do evil, they know scripture. Well, the church that you're supposed to render unto Caesar what is Caesar. Okay, sure, got it. But when Caesar ain't doing what's right, I'm supposed to speak up. Because Romans 12 and 2 says this, that we as the body of Christ, we as Christians are not supposed to conform to the world. That's right. We're supposed to transform it by the renewing of our minds. But when you drive around in Dallas County and you see churches with the rainbow flag, now look, if they, if they have a rainbow flag because they're remembering God's promise to Noah, I, I, Colonel's all right. I'm good. I got it. But if that rainbow flag means something other than that, ain't down with it. Or that other little funky colored flag. Mm -hmm. Or if you're going down, I think it's Highway 67, you see a Black Lives Matter <laughs> banner on a church. And, and I'm thinking, okay, now... The folks that started that organization said they're about Marxists. And last time I checked, Karl Marx hated Christianity. That's so true. We just have allowed the devil to just walk right on up, not into our house, but into our house of worship. So true. And why are men supposedly allowing that to happen? You know, a couple weekends ago was the most precious most revered time in our Christian faith. It's, it's the basis of who we are. I mean, if this doesn't happen, if, if it's not, you know, then what are we doing? We're wasting our time. Even Paul wrote about that. And it was Christ's death and his resurrection. Because mm -hmm. that's what it's all about. Him going to the cross, him going up on the high ground mm -hmm. of Calvary and all of our sins being nailed to the cross and his blood washed is us clean. Him going down into the grave and rising up so that he could conquer the grave so that we could have eternal life. Amen. But all of a sudden on Good Friday, our government puts out a proclamation. It's Transgender Day of Visibility on Resurrection Day. And every single doggone pastor in the United States of America, true pastors, they should have been outraged. There should have been a cry across the land that would have been deafening to the people that sit in Washington, D.C. But was there? No. I guarantee you that there were some churches that people showed up in church, they didn't even know it. <laughs> they didn't know what happened. Pastors, men, Supposedly, of God. Well, you know, Brother Colonel, I hear what you're saying. But you know, I got to protect my 501c3 status. You know, I can't get involved in this kind of politics and stuff and everything. Mm -hmm. well, let me tell you something. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 through 5, what does it say to pastors? It tells them to preach the word in season and out. That's right. It says that there will come a time when people will want to have their ears tickled, when they will reject the truth and they will seek out false doctrines. And that's the time that we're in. Now, last time I checked, I really don't think that God's going to ask you about your 501c3 status when you show up in heaven and pass on Robert. I mean, I think he's going he's to ask you, did you preach the word in season and out? Were you the shepherd that guarded my flock? instead of feeding them to the wolves. Mm -hmm. Now is the time for the, the men of Christ to rise up. Amen. I have never seen such a, an affront to who we are as Christians as what we see now and today. That's and as I look at this group in gathering here, this is how heaven's going to look. Heaven's not going to be with well, white folks over here, <laughs> black folks, they got their section over here, they got their neighborhood and the Hispanic neighborhood over there, okay, and then the Asians got their neighborhood over there. No, it's just going to be all of us. Yeah, all of us. Because it's about our soul. It's not about this. 
And if we continue to allow ourselves to be divided because of this, you know, there's a great video out there. I love going on college and university campuses and speaking. Sometimes it can get rather sporty, okay? And so I was at Northwestern University about six or seven years ago speaking about the Iranian nuclear agreement. I love foreign policy, military policy, and all this kind of stuff. So, and Northwestern is like one of these real smart kids school. I don't know if y'all checked it out. You gotta have one of them big GPAs. I, I, I would not even been able to like get a bottle of water at Northwestern University. When, you know, when I, that's why I went to University of Tennessee. But anyhow, the very first question that a young lady asked me, and you can Google this, this has, people tell me it has like 22 million views. Wow. The very first question the young lady asked me, black female, do you identify as black? <laughs> I mean, you can, you can look at the video, you can see my face, I was like, what? But see, we now have this mentality that your skin color defines you. And it defines who you are and how you think. God pushes past that. He sees this. He sees your heart. He sees your soul. And that's what men have to start talking about. That's what men have to start professing. Because if they don't, then we're going to lose the greatest nation that the world has ever known. Marxism is all about separating us, dividing us. Mm -hmm. Marxism is all about telling us that man can create some type of utopia. Man can create some type of heaven here on earth. Mm -hmm. Marxism is all about telling us that everybody has to kind of like be alike. God says that we are all made individually in his likeness, in his image. But each and every one of us has our own gifts and talents and what have you. Equity means equality of outcomes. I like that. Amen. Okay. Somebody else is determining where you're going to go and what you can do. Everybody's just on you know, the same flat line. I don't want to be an average student. I don't want to be a C student. Y'all don't want the Dallas Cowboys to keep losing. You know, and play. Y'all want them to get, come back and start winning championships again. Am I right? You don't want the Dallas Mavericks to be in the NBA playoffs and, and not win. You don't want the Dallas Stars to be in the Stanley Cup playoffs and not win. So why all of a sudden do we have this belief that mediocrity is okay? Mediocrity ain't okay for the body of Christ. That's right. That's why you're on the high ground. You know what the motto is for Liberty University? Unlike any motto at any college or university in the United States of America, training champions for Christ. Not champions in football. Not, cha not, 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 not champions in business. Football. Training champions for Christ is the motto for Liberty University. What men should be doing every single day is first and foremost trying to be a champion for Christ. And secondly, Helping somebody else, training them to be a champion for Christ. Amen. Let me close because then I'll open up for questions. You know, people want to ask me. Anything. Let me close by I have not read my morning devotional, so I figured I'd share it and read it with you all. Okay? So, as I said, this is Strength for Today for Men, 365 devotionals, April the 13th of 2024. If you turn to 1 Corinthians 1 and 25. 1 Corinthians 1 and 25. If you have your Bibles. And I think this is very appropriate for where we are today. God, God is really good. The foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Remember how Paul talked about how a thorn in my flesh was given unto me so that I would not elevate myself. And I asked the Lord to take this thorn away from me, but my God, God told him that, Jesus told him that you are perfected in weakness, for when you are weak, you are strong. That's how you have to see yourself. So let me share with you. It says, it seems strange to read about God's foolishness and weakness. But what Paul is trying to help us understand is that in all things and in every way, God is greater. 
We live in a do-it-yourself world where many of us want to figure things out on our own. That's just how we're wired as men. Remember, we don't like to ask anybody for directions. We'll run around and be lost for days thinking we know where we are, okay? But you can't always do it on your own. We think that if we ask for help, we're admitting that we are weak. Hmm. This verse reminds us that even at our greatest and strongest, we still don't compare to God. Isn't it encouraging to know that God is not only wise and strong, but that he is on our side? Amen. And if God be for us, Romans 8 and 31, I believe, then who could be against us? We can confidently come to him knowing that he is more than sufficient. My grace is sufficient. That's what he told Paul. To help us in every situation we will ever find ourselves in. And likewise, when others come to us for help, we can do our best to guide them by pointing them to God. And this is the closing prayer for today's devotional. God, help me to rest in your strength and wisdom. Help me to trust you to help me and not try to accomplish everything in my own strength. Thank you for the wisdom and strength that you gladly share with us, your children. Yeah. Remember what God told Joshua? Two things. Be strong and of good courage. When God looked down at Solomon and said, what is it that you want? I will grant it to you. Solomon only asked for two things. Wisdom and discernment. Yeah. Every single day going forward, men of God... Ask the Lord for strength and courage and wisdom and discernment. And know that nothing will ever overpower you. Nothing will ever overcome you. That's how we will go out and make sure that when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Stand strong. Be of good courage. Show wisdom and display discernment. Or as it says in Micah 6 through 8, Seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. What are your questions? Thank you. Amen.